Good, thank you, Juan. Um, it's two minutes past two o'clock um, here in Berlin, so um, I suggest that we slowly get started. Um, thank you all for joining this webinar by ALEA, uh, the Federation of uh, European Academies of Sciences and Humanities. Uh, my name is Matthijs Vleugel. I'm a scientific policy officer at ALEA. Um, and um, before we start, I would like to draw your attention to a few practical matters. Um, first of all, um, I would ask everyone to keep yourself muted during the webinar. Um, there will be plenty of opportunity at the end of the webinar to ask questions, to give comments, um, but we'll uh, try to do all of this after the presentations that we'll get. Um, and when you want to ask a question or give a comment, please use the raise hand button. Um, and so I think everyone should be familiar with this. If there's any technical issues, um, please contact my colleague who is visible in the chat at, under Alea Secretariat, um, and she will try to help you out. Um, and finally, um, as you can see, we are recording uh, the event, um, but we are planning to do this only for um, the presentation part of the, of the webinar. Um, so when the pre presentations are finished and we start the discussion, um, the recording will be switched off and everyone can speak uh, freely in the discussion. So for today's program, um, we will um, start by a quick introduction of the two chairs of the ALEA task force. And first, there will be Professor Pere Tikkermenek, uh, ALEA board member and uh, one of the task force chairs. And the second uh, task force chair is Heinz Müller from the Swiss Academies of Arts and Sciences. And he will introduce the recently published ALEA statement on IP issues related to genomic techniques. And following this, we will get two short impulses to get the discussion started, uh, one of them by Dr. Sven Bostin from the University of Copenhagen, and one of them from Professor Christina Gold from the University of Oldenburg. Um, all of this should take us approximately half an hour, so there will be um, almost an hour left for, uh, for discussion and uh, for hearing your views. Um, so not to take too much of your time now, I would hand over uh, to Pera, who is going to um, get the introduction started. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us in this webinar. It seems that it has raised uh, some attention, which we welcome. Uh, from Alea, uh, you see... Uh, ALEA is the association of the European Federation of Academies of Sciences and Humanities. Uh, we are more than 50 academies from about 40 countries in Europe. Uh, our landscape is uh, following the Council of Europe as um, members, uh, so it's larger than the European Union. And uh, we have uh, some uh, some uh, traditional activities. Uh, we see our uh, our goals as number one, serving European academies and facilitating cooperation, shaping conditions of research, providing scientific advice, facilitating good group research practice. We have just recently published a revision of the uh, European Code of Conduct for is research integrity, defending uh, freedom of science, strengthening uh, equality and inclusion. So uh, we, uh, those are the, the goals of our uh, association. Next slide, please, Matthias. Uh, so uh, following the scope the, the, of uh, ALEA, we have, uh, and under two, we have an undertaken this, um, this task force. Uh, even before uh, Alea was asked by the Belgian Academy of Sciences to make a, a reflection on uh, the landscape of new genomic uh, technologies, we made a symposium and then uh, we have been active in these discussions, which are still being uh, active in the European uh, organ institutions. So, but in this case of the uh, IP system for new genomic technologies, it is at, after the request of the Swiss Academy. That's the reason why we decided that uh, we will have 
two co-chairs of this task force, one from the Leobor, the other one from the Swiss Academy, and uh, after me, Heinz Müller, which is the other uh, co-chairman of this task force, will present. So uh, after the request of the Swiss Academy of uh, Arts and Sciences, we have discussed uh, the establishment of a task force that uh, the members are here. Uh, we try to uh, identify people who can provide advice on this on this uh, uh, complex question. We know that it has to be uh, taken from uh, different points of view. Uh, this is the legal, the technological, the economic point of view. So we uh, uh, have uh, identified these people, nominated these people who are here, that we have elaborated uh, the opinion that it has been published uh, last month. So next uh, slide. Uh, during the, uh, the discussion of the statement, we have consulted a number of people that we thought that could be that could provide different points of view. You see, are people from different types of uh, breeding companies, mostly those who are more involved in these matters, but also academicians who know well the, the IP system in, in Europe. You know that uh, in Europe we have uh, intellectual property in these matters is uh, regulated by a directive uh, from 1998. So, and we have uh, talked to all these people and finally the task force have uh, approved the statement that uh, just now uh, Heinz Müller will talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you from my side also for joining this webinar. I think uh, I will not take too much of your time for asking questions. I, I assume that all of you have read the statement, but let me go through the important points very quickly. Uh, the IP protection of plants and plant varieties and breeding technologies in Europe are somewhat uh, regulated by the EU Biotechnology Directive, the UPOF Convention 1961, and the Community Plant Variety Rights 1994. But I think nowadays with the new genome technologies, patents are the most important part here. And the statement mostly deals with the patents, not leaving out the other things, but mostly deals with patents because we think these, uh, these, uh, these are actually the main problems small breeders and small farmers have to deal with. It's patents not only for, from the APO, but also from the national offices around Europe. IP challenges are related to NGTs like accelerated technology development. Uh, this has certainly to do with patent stacking, complexity of the patent landscape that's uh, evolving more and more. Next thing there would be the legal disputes and lack of clarity. Legal dis disputes can be very costly, you all know that. And lack of clarity can be that it is not exactly clear what is protected and what is not. And it very much differs as well in different legislations, not only in Europe, but around the world. Monopolization and ex exclusive licensing are also a problem. So there is no clear rule who gets a license and who not. And the lack of transparency. Lack of transparency is that you do not know exactly what it is, what is actually patented and what is not. So it's not, not necessarily transparent from the patent itself. These four things actually are not only a problem for land patenting, but they are something that uh, is important for all technical fields. So it's nothing special for plant technologies. 
for the scope of our, our statement, I would just remind you that we do not deal with an environmental, political, ethical, or social issues and not with a EU regulations or the individual state like legislations on NGTs uh, around Europe. And it does deal only with Europe. So we didn't look further into the world, what would happen there, because we thought we are all from Europe and we should actually deal with it in Europe alone. Uh, the, it also does not answer questions, the statement does not answer questions regarding the conformity of the proposed solutions with international agreements. So we didn't go into the agreements, we didn't go into legal issues very much in order to find solutions for the problems we have. Next slide, please. And the problems are the consequences for breeders and farmers. The risk for the breeders not to have access to all genetic material is very clear. It's also in some other areas that uh, the, the, the players in the field don't have access to all material that would be needed for the further development of the technology. They are very much uh, very much uh, afraid that they would infringe an existing NGT plant related patent because they do not know what is covered by a patent and what is not. And the risk that breeders cannot obtain the required license for NGT platform technologies is also here. And what is also important and sometimes overlooked is that there is a risk of patent infringement due to naturally occurring cross-pollination, pollination from another field. That can happen. These two things, these two things actually, the, the risk of not having access to all genetic material and uh, that they cannot obtain the required license for NGT platform technologies these are also risks in other technical fields. Again, I mean, all technical fields have their problems or might have their problems with, with patents and the, the, the covering of the patents of technologies. That does not mean from my side, by the way, that I think patents are bad. They, are, they have some very good, very good sides and we should not forget about these sides of the patent. Uh, protection. Next slide, please. So our measures, these are this is probably the most important part of the statement. Our measures are divided into short term, medium term and long term, because we think that at short term, something can be done relatively fast. We say within a few years, I hope within a year or two. Uh, the medium terms, however, they might need much more time and negotiations, and we, we think uh, it's around five to 10 years at least. And the long-term measures are the most difficult ones and they probably need even much more time. So first of all, facilitating the access to patent information. This is something which has to do with the education of the people that use these technologies especially the small breeders, they are not used to look at patents. They are used at looking at the variety protection of plants and not necessarily dealing with patents. So this is more or less education and, and helping them to understand what they are going to do and how they have to deal with the patent landscape. Then mandating patent database registration and mandating licensing database registration. These are two things at the beginning, at least they should be mandatory because then it's relatively easy to introduce them. The next thing is stricter interpretation of patentability requirements. This could be also relatively easy done, especially at the EPO with changing the rules a little bit into this direction so that it is much clearer what is patented and what is not. 
structured licensing schemes of publicly funded research outcomes. This is something that has very often uh, uh, talked about and was demanded by certain groups and people in academia as well. So this would mean that publicly funded research outcomes could be patented, but only with a licensing scheme that allows people to license these technologies. And then the ethical licensing, that's something that is a so-called self-regulation. It's probably not so easy to have that introduced uh, all over Europe and even all over the world. Then we have the medium-term measures. The medium-term measures are no patents on food plants. So no patents on plants, but certainly on technologies. This is also something which is talked about quite a lot. Might be difficult to introduce because it could open a Pandora's box. So other technical areas could come and say, well, we also need to exclude, for example, the medicaments from being patented, but of course the, the technology to produce these medicaments could be. And then introducing patent pools, also something that could be done. Uh, it's not clear right now, and that must be negotiated and discussed how these patent pools would look like and who would be uh, part of these patent pools. Would a small breeder also be able to be part without contributing anything? Standard essential patents, you might all uh, know the, the term friend. This is something which I think could be introduced and uh, would help actually to ease the problems with the patents quite a lot. And then the long-term measures over 10 years, I think, is compulsory licen licensing. A relatively hard thing to do. Right now it's regulated by other uh, authorities like the WTO. And uh, therefore, it's kind of difficult to introduce it and to force people to give compulsory licensing. Amending the EU biotechnology directive, also something that needs a lot of negotiations and may take quite a few of quite, quite some time. And then as a third thing, a new type of IPR for plants alone, not the plant variety production, but something that actually covers the thing like the patent does, but would be handled completely different. This would be something that would need to be introduced worldwide. So you can think about how long that might, might, might last until something like this is in place. Okay, I'm done with that. I'm handing back to Matis. Thank you very much, uh, Heinz. Um, so now we'll follow two short impulses to the discussion. Um, I will first give the word to Sven Bostin from the University of Copenhagen. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for um, uh, being here in uh, quite large numbers. Um, I want to start as well with thanking, first of all, the two co-chairs for um, the confidence they had in uh, in in. in well, selecting me as one of their um, task force members. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, all my co-task uh, force members for the very pleasant and fruitful discussions we had. Uh, and thirdly, of course, I would like to thank um, uh, Matthijs for his German style efficiency uh, in, uh, in in setting everything up, uh, even though I think he's not German. Uh, so, but nevertheless, uh, people are adaptable as he has, uh, he shows. Um, so, um, what I will do here is give a couple of comments, um, high level comments, and I will largely deal with um, more long term uh, things. And you can see that there's a negative and a positive. The negative thing is obviously that uh, if I've said something, people will have forgotten about it by the time it's implemented. Uh, the positive approach is that uh, I also want to look at 
longer term uh, solutions because this is something of course that will not disappear uh, very quickly i'm now and then looking away because i have some notes i've scribbled down and i have to look at my other screen so it's nothing personal or it's not a nervous stick or anything it's just a, a necessary thing because of the setup of my computer um first i want to start with something that i think will be brought up anyway um, and it is of course the recent developments uh, relating to um NGTs and uh, the GMO legislation that uh, has been um, been debated in, at European Parliament and actually been concluded at the European Parliament level, because I think, okay, will be brought up and as well give my uh, views on this. Uh, whatever I say is my personal views, however, so I mean, I have not, of course, uh, the uh, hubris of... Um, basically uh, taking my co-members into the bath of my responsible or irresponsible utterances. Um, so as you know that uh, the European Parliament has voted in favor of amendments amongst others, some of these amendments, and of course we don't have the time to deal with all of them, but some of the amendments uh, have attempted to uh, prohibit for the future patents on NGT plants. There is already a discussion of what that exactly might mean because the formulation used in the amendments is not necessarily always clear. Uh, but okay, let's assume that we know something that it has to do with exclusion of patentable subject matter for NGT plants. What do you then? Well, of course, I mean, abolishing patentability of something is always a relatively... Um, a straightforward thing to do. It's always an option and sometimes an easy option for a complex problem. Uh, I sometimes call it dreaming away the actual problem by saying, well, that's excluded. Uh, question is, is it a good answer, in, if for example, in excluding those things from patentability? Um, well, it's mixed, the answer. A couple of considerations in that uh, context. First of all, uh, having no patents on NGT plants will not prevent, of course, uh, breeders from still being called by uh, patents on the technology of genome editing, because that's a generic technology that uh, covers, of course, all kinds of technical areas. So that doesn't really solve the problem uh, entirely. Uh, my same thing you could say potentially for some of the enzyme platforms that need to be used. There could also pat be patents on those that obviously that might also have multiple applications. And again, you would be called by those. So it's not going to solve the problem, to be honest. Um, secondly, and that's a bit beyond the law, um, Europe is a knowledge-based economy. I mean, we are not, we don't produce toilet bowls or these kind of things anymore. Uh, that's been outsourced to other parts of the world. So we are a knowledge-based economy, which means for us, it's absolutely uh, essential for our existence and our future that uh, we have innovation. I mean, that's about the only thing we have. Um, and innovation is necessary. I think you can like it or not, but innovation is necessary, of course, in the context of plants because we have serious problems with regard to climate change and sustainable farming. So if you abolish uh, patents on NGT plants and maybe by extension on some of the technology, then if you want to be effective, um, then obviously the innovation will most likely stop in Europe because there's no need anymore um, because you can't get a patent. So uh, especially, apart from special trade kind of things, you have no interest in, of course, in doing fundamental innovation. So Europe will become an importer of technology um which is not never a good uh, solution of course uh, because you don't steer of course developments anymore secondly or thirdly uh, you also want to uh, hope then that the technology that's being developed in other countries and patented in other countries is obviously going to help for you because of course there's biotic and abiotic stresses that are not necessarily identical across the world and of course Parts of the world will develop technologies that for which they have a good market. Um, so, um, and that might not necessarily be the market for Europe, uh, of not, or not always. That might, of course, also be problematic then, that technologies we might need are not available uh, as such. We can develop them ourselves, but in view of the fact that this is very, very expensive technology, it's not going to happen very quickly. Um, so, 
uh, as, uh, another development is obviously that if there's no patent protection available, there is, there's now uh, recent reports which have uh, confirmed that, there's obviously uh, the escape to um, uh, trade secrets. And of course, in NGTs, there is quite considerable technology that is not reverse engineerable. And as a consequence, you can decide to keep it secret by developing these kind of trade secret based models. That's also, of course, not helping anyone. Um, and as a consequence, of course, might also be a negative side effect of excluding those things. So I'm not sure that uh, abolishing patent protection, I have to, uh, uh, because I'm timing myself, is not the best economic and geopolitical uh, idea, maybe. Uh, but OK, it's not uh, me who has to decide on all these kind of things. So I, I would think further in terms of mitigating effects of patents. And of course, that's what uh, we in the task force have been thinking about uh, extensively. My colleague, Professor Gotchi, will uh, give you some um, solutions and I will give some others more long long term and I will not sp uh, spend too much time because uh, I know uh, time is precious and we want to give you the chance to ask a lot of questions. Um, we want to make sure of course that the technology is available and you can do that by different ways. It has already been suggested by introducing some kind of friend system um, derived from the standard essential patterns uh, um, area. I mean, that can be done. Uh, it will take some time to develop it, but it can be done, I think. So that could be already a good solution. Um, another thing is the, I want to briefly touch upon and, and, and maybe one of the last things I want to say is the, um, the compulsory cross licensing under Article 12 of the Biotech Directive. I mean, we have to be honest that it doesn't work as it is now. And at one day, this might need to be revised. Uh, this provision um but there is a solution for that you can, if you do it uh, then there is a way out it basically by reversing uh, the order so instead of that the uh, breeder has to show some kind of significant technical advance i would say otherwise i would say that if the patent is demonstrating significant technical advance which is indispensable for follow on inventors innovators to use then he has to grant um, a license. So that could be a, a solution to that. Um, and with that, I would like to leave it uh, here so that my uh, colleague, Professor Gott, uh, has the opportunity to um, enlighten you with her solutions. Uh, so thank you very much for this. Christina, uh, feel free to go ahead. Oh, okay, so I will not present uh, my own ones, at least not uh, uh, not in the forefront, but I want to stress those measures which can be implemented without legislation. So this is the first part of our joint statement. And I will just pick and highlight three of them. So um, I see a lot of light when uh, with regard to funding institutions. So those can already ease the patent ticket when they link their financial support to the conditions that deri deriving future innovations will be licensed under grant conditions. So for those who are not familiar with FRAND, again, so this acronym stands for FAIR, Reasonable and Non-Discriminatory Terms. That mean a future license will not be rejected just because, and in conjunction with a non-discrimination uh, non commitment, the funded institution uh, is submitted to grant access as of right. And reasonable, in addition, means that the costs are to be moderate. So these practices have already been practiced in the medical sector by various governmental and non-governmental institutions inter alia, like the US National Institutes of Health, documented by stakeholders like Health Actions International. And those practices can also be transferred to the specific NGT problematic uh, sector of plant breeders and farmers. So those uh, practices would already alleviate many of the expected problems. Second, our inquiry made clear that several actors are simply not interested 
in using this technology, both breeders and farmers. The fact that the material will not be distinguishable from conventional, prior existing and naturally mutated material with, will raise and affect their freedom to operate. So those NGT-free zones need to remain identifiable and defendable, not only by labeling, but also about total liability and by operable defenses against patent injunctions under civil procedure. It is an important liberal principle that it is for the claimant to prove all facts which support his or her claim. So in this situation, the prior existing, in, or in a situation where prior existing material and possibly violating material is identical, the simple comparison of material cannot suffice. So lawyers, what lawyers call secondary burden of, uh, to substantiate, cannot simply rest on the breeders or farmers. So, and breeders cannot simply be required to open their breeding books. This situation gives evidence that courts need and presumably will also come up with alleviations, and I simplify for the current situation, to alleviate the burden of proof on the side of the defendant. And the third point I like to make is uh, that more rigorous examination of patent filings by patent offices can already today better steer the growth in patent numbers and the patent scope. Both is necessary. The claim for a rigorous test of no novelty, inventive step and patent exclusive exclusions is recurring on a regular base and also here. So obviously institutional pressures hinder the proactive stance of the European and the national patent offices. Therefore, more public scrutiny is needed and presumably, again, a clarification um, by the European Commission on the normative content of the biotech directive. So I like to refer to the um, Max Planck Institute's working paper of last year, which almost reads like a roadmap for the European Commission. And I just want to mention some keywords. Clari clarity would be improved is random non-targeted mutagenesis is clearly qualified as essentially biological. As for technological processes, the scope of protection should be clarified along French and Austrian examples and Swiss examples. And the practice of disclaimers requires a critical scrutiny. In some, patent offices are called upon to do some housekeeping. A laissez-faire policy is currently not at stake. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Sven Bostin and Christina Bott for your contributions. Um, I would hand back now to uh, Pera to um, lead the discussion. Um, and to hear what comments and questions you might have. Thank you.